kids podcast. <laughs> you can go slow. A kids podcast about. Hi, this is Matthew, and I'm head of podcasts at a kids company about. We are so glad you're listening to this show, and I wanted to let you know that we've got an entire network of podcasts dedicated to producing original content that talks up to kids, centers the things going on in their world, and engages and challenges how they see the world and themselves. With shows about facts, climate justice, current events, and activism, there's a show out there made just for your kid. Check out the A Kids Podcast About channel on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found, or visit akidsco.com. What is technology? Technology is tools or machines we use to solve problems or make life easier in general, like phones and cars. Technology is anything that you use uh, in relation to yourself to do something else. Welcome to A Kid's Book About, the podcast. I'm Matthew. I'm a teacher, a librarian, and I'm your host. The voices you heard at the top of our show were from Azalea and Amber. Each week we talk about the big things going on in your world with a different author from our A Kid's Book About series. Hi, my name is Amber Case, and I am a human cyborg. I am the author of a kid's book about technology. Today, the word technology is most often used to describe electronic devices. But as you heard at the top of the show, technology encompasses all the tools that we use in order to do something else. So for instance, a hammer you use to put a nail into a wall. You can also use it to open up a walnut. You use a pencil to write in a book, in a notebook to take notes. You use a pair of shoes to take a walk or a run outside or to climb a tree. And you use your eyes if you have glasses or contact lenses. That's a technology that helps you to see. But in reality, all of our tools are technology. So it's not just the computer or your phone. That's a piece of technology that helps you to see lots of different media types um, and read things online and helps you to connect to other people's information. And sometimes if you use it well, can help you connect to other people. Speaking, words, that's also technology. The words on the page, the words that we're using on this podcast to get to you, these are all technologies that humans have invented to do new things. Uh, there's some technologies that, you know, just looking into somebody else's eyes or running and jumping and playing, like these, these are things that we don't need a lot of technology to do, but we've become used to growing up alongside technology. And sometimes our technology uses us and sometimes we use our technology, but I'd like to see a world in which we work alongside our technology, kind of like we hang out with a favorite pet, like a dog or a cat. Listeners, when you start to train yourself to notice technologies in your home, in your school, in the world around you, you'll see that technology is and has always been all around us. I think most people think of computers or maybe a Terminator or RoboCop or something on TV or like a super epic car or like a battle bot, like something that's like a lot more in your face and like really intense or some people are like, ah, technology is changing so much. It's intense. I don't understand it. Or I totally am into technology and like all of technology. It's, it's always like a very, it's like a big thought and it has lots of images and it's like associated with speed and intensity or like super fun or connective or friends. But I don't think a lot of people think of like a light switch as a piece of technology, even though we use it every day and it's just in our environment. And that's just as much of a successful technology as like an app on our phone, except it's been around for even longer. So I would say it's even more successful than like a social networking app, for instance. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like I really take a whole day of your life and just like look at all the different pieces of technology that you use. Some of them you look at when you're using some of them, you don't even notice. 
try to really think about all the tech that you use that isn't really noticeable, like uh, a faucet <laughs> and a sink or like a toilet or your shoes or in the car, like the foot pedal, like all the different pieces in your life that have been designed. Most of them have de- been designed by humans and a lot of them have also been designed by nature. Think about your favorite climbing tree. And none of them are perfect. Like, I think the, the, the thing about, like, when I was growing up, I always thought, oh, okay, so this is how the world is. But, it, but in reality, you can design an alternative to a sink. You can design an alternative to a car, you know, like a bicycle. And it's up to us and our imaginations and our creativity to not just say, okay, this is what the world is, but, like, how could it be different? What does that mean? How could it be, like, slightly better? And just, like... Use your imagination more because it it seems like everything is exactly what it is. But in reality, all over the world, tons of different cultures have their own technologies. And exploring how they work alongside their environment is just as exciting as like just exploring your own environment. We all have different relationships to the technology in our life, and these relationships can change and shift based on what technology we're using, how we're using it, and how much we're using it. What's your relationship with technology? I really like paint and pencils and notebooks, Uh, and I do like my phone, but I find that when I wake up in the morning and... I use my phone and I use social networks. Sometimes I just have really sad thoughts. Like sometimes I feel like I'm not good enough or I'm seeing all these other people do something more exciting than me or I feel left out. And that's just when I've woken up. I haven't even had a chance to do anything in the day. I'm already seeing what other people have done. It's kind of unfair. So what I try not to do is I try not to look at my phone in the morning just because I know that it changes my emotions towards the world a lot. And I forget that, like, I'm enough without having to do anything. Um, And and it kind of prevents me from thinking about, like, longer-term stuff, like, longer-term thought. That's hard for me. Like, I would say that I have problems with, like, being addicted to my phone, which is funny because, you know, I wrote another book called Calm Technology, which is how you can not be as addicted to your phone. But it's still, I have to remember, like, there are different kinds of time, you know, the, the kind of chronos time, which is that kind of industrial time where it goes by really fast when you're on your computer. It goes by really slow when you're bored in class. And then the kairos time, like watching a sunset, going on a walk, playing with friends, like that's a special type of time and that's the more human time. And so when I'm on my phone a lot, either like thinking that I'm not good enough or getting excited about something out like, and my emotions are just all over the place. I have to remember, like, wait, how do I get more Kairos time in my life? How do I step away and, like, do something that I want to do? And sometimes I have to put my phone in the other room and say, like, okay, for half of each day, I'm not going to do things on this phone. It's too complicated. <laughs> you know, it's too much. And But it's really hard because there's so much stuff on the phone. And there's so many cool videos of cats and dogs and stuff that I want to share. Oh, my gosh. And it's not like I can install something on my phone that says, stop doing that. That kind of sounds like a parent, right? It's like, how does it come from like within you? And you say, how do I want to spend my day? Like, what do I want to think about today? What do I want to do today? I feel like everyone should have that choice. And the phone shouldn't choose that for you. The phone shouldn't be choosing how you feel about yourself. And the phone shouldn't be choosing whether you feel happy or sad or excited or depressed during the day, like you should be determining what you want to feel like. We will be back in a minute with more from Amber Case, including why our brains get excited about shiny objects and bright colors right after this quick break. is Leo Abelo Perry, and I'm the host of The Activators, a kid's podcast about activism. On this podcast, we want to celebrate and amplify kids who are activating social change by doing what they love. We'll talk and learn from other kids who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. We'll learn about different issues that need our attention. 
things like gender equality, environmental justice, and food insecurity. And we'll hear some advice from kids, for kids, on how we can make a real difference in our world. So, to every kid who's listening right now, no matter if you're already an activator or you're just getting started, get up and do your superhero pose. All right, you ready? On three, we're all going to say activators in our superhero pose. One, two, three, activators! Welcome back to A Kid's Book About, the podcast. On today's episode, we're talking about technology with A Kid's Book About author Amber Case. Midway through our interview, Amber shared a term with me that I'd never heard before. Supernormal stimuli. Can you break that apart? Can you try to determine what it means? Because this next part, this next part really blew me away. In nature, things are not so bright. I mean, like, if you're in a tropical rainforest, everything is, like, really amazing and really bright. But this term is called supernormal stimuli, which just means... So our brains get really excited about shiny objects and bright colors, and we get really distracted. And so what the phone does with all of its colors is it brings us all of this, like, social media with bright colors and extremes, like an extreme story about something bad that happened, an extremely cute kitten, an extremely exciting, colorful picture, you know, or really cool clothing we can get online. And we start adding our imagination to it. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh, after a while, 30 minutes later, we're wrapped up in it. So that super normal stimuli, like, once you see it, uh, once you understand what it is, like, you know, you could go through, you know, the rest of today, you could say, okay, where's the super normal stimuli? Oh my gosh, it's that magazine. Oh, it's that sign. Oh, it's the social media. Oh, it's that person's outfit. Ah, and, and once you see it, it's really hard to unsee. But it's also important to know because, again, you should be able to have a choice whether you want to immerse yourself in that or not. Your whole day can be made up of totally different things. Like sometimes that stuff is really fun. Like having a birthday party is full of super normal stimuli. You've got a crazy cake and you have crazy hats and like insane music. And like you might do some fun thing like indoor skydiving or something. But like that can't be like every day. And when you're in moments where there isn't a lot of supernormal stimuli and you're depressed, it's important to be able to make your own happy chemicals like dopamine, serotonin. These are things within your head that you should be able to kind of make. So if you are finding yourself depressed or like scared or any of these big emotions and you want to get out of them, you can just sit there having that deep breathing, just focus on your breath and just kind of watch the thoughts go through your head as if like you're flipping pages in a magazine. Don't read the articles of your thoughts. You know, you can get into a thought and just like let it take you over. But like just kind of zoom out of your thoughts in your brain. Just kind of watch them flipping by and breathe. And that secretly is meditation. You, you have more superpowers than you think. And the biggest superpower is your breathing, ironically. Listeners, I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask Amber as well. How does using technology make you feel? I'm sure different technology causes different feelings for different reasons at different points of your day. So feel free to respond to this question however you'd like. And feel free to ask that grown-up near you, too. How does thinking about technology or using technology make you feel? I think there is a lot of technology in this world sometimes too much but I think a lot of it can be useful like in school or things like that as long as we don't go overboard but I do think replacing paper and things like that can be good for the environment as well as our minds but it does have side effects like headaches and things like that. I think building something using a paintbrush and painting or writing or like playing with friends or climbing a tree or like Going rock climbing in a gym, that is super fun. And I'm using technology as tools, and I'm working alongside the tools to get the thing done. It's awesome. So, you know, thinking about technology, if, if I'm using it for fun, and I'm using it to create, and I'm doing more with it, then I'm having a great time. But if I'm not, and sometimes I have to do really boring stuff online, and I hate it, 
Uh, a lot of times technology that's slow and poorly built just makes me so mad. Zoom makes me really tired. <laughs> um, Cause it's like, you, you know, you're looking at yourself half the time. You're looking at other people. You're, you might be trying to do something to the side and it's really hard to just sit there and breathe and be fully present. Knowing when something gives you energy, when something makes you feel more alive and more connected to what you're doing, that's a bit of a superpower in and of itself. And I love that Amber brought that up. Technologies are tools, but not all tools are right for the job. And not all tools are helpful, depending on the circumstances. I've saved the final question of this interview for a listener question, because this question is next level. It comes from Azalea in Ontario, Canada. I think I wonder, I think I'm wondering <laughs> um, how so many people come up with this stuff. Like we're taught coding in school, but I think the way we're taught it isn't necessarily, I don't think we're taught how people come up with it. I think we're taught how to make it from what other people know already. I have a few questions regarding that, like, um, why aren't we taught that we should have a creative process to think about it and we're taught how to do these things on scratch or things like that. So I guess my question is um, why don't we learn about having the process of thinking of these things that make our lives easier? Why are we learning um, how to make these things that people already have made instead? This is the best question I've ever heard. I think I'm going to cry. Seriously, this is like really upsetting. Let's let's just just to have a moment here. Whoever this person is is telling the truth because it is the saddest thing that when you're in school, you get taught how to use a thing. You don't get taught how to build a thing. You get taught how to use a programming language, but you don't get taught how people come up with a programming language. We don't ever learn about the process of thinking that to make these things that make our lives easier. Like very rarely do you have a program that does that unless you go to grad school, unless you go to like MIT Media Lab in the lifelong kindergarten group. That's, that's a place where you can learn it. You can go to art school. Oftentimes it's the intersection of somebody who like has an architecture degree plus a computer science degree or it is a philosophy major like Stuart Butterfield who built Slack. People don't talk about these things. So as an anthropologist, I decided to get a degree in anthropology because I was really into technology as a kid, but I wanted to know where it came from and how it was made. And there aren't a lot of stories, like it's more about asking questions. Like you can ask people, where did this come from? And for people like Azalea, who has asked, in my opinion, the most important question in computer science today, in terms of computer science education, is that how do we learn about patterns and history versus just what's there. And I think that was what I was trying to get at with, with the previous thing I was saying, which is consider that almost all the things that we use are built by humans, and some of them are built by nature. But to say, this isn't how it's always going to be, to try to build something different, or, or, or it's, it's very hard because a lot of people don't want to see change. They're really used to a thing how it is. And when we do make something new, Maybe the thing isn't 30 years old that we've made. It's brand new. So it has issues with it. And so how do you make something and then improve it over time? How do you know which design direction to go? How do you know to make it stable? How do you know how to make it delightful? And to do this, you can have principles, but very few people have made principles of design. I made one called Calm Technology, which actually took principles from 30 years ago that were really ahead of their time. And you can go to calmtech.com and you can see all these principles. You could design a new product or company based on these principles a bunch of people have. And uh, I was on tour with that book for five years and I flew all over the world. I even got to speak with the king and queen of Spain and the president of Chile. And I got to go to Antarctica because I wrote this book. Because I asked a question like this person, Azalea, about how about having principles and patterns for making good things instead of just saying what is and learning what's already been made. And the people that dare to ask those questions and the people that make new things and say, oh, 
HTML has a problem, I'm going to make this new thing called CSS. The people that think laterally, the, the people that aren't afraid to like learn about biology and like technology and something else, those are the people that make almost all of the new systems in the world. And that question that Azalea asked is the most powerful question you could ask in this space. And really incredible human being. Azalea, if you're listening, please send me a note. I'd love to talk with you more and send you some information and books. I'm happy to do that. Gosh, thank you for existing. As technology innovations continue to be introduced into the world, and as the world you're growing into continues to change, I'll leave you with this final message from Amber. As a kid, you know you can create your own worlds. You know, Miyazaki, who makes lots and lots of anime films, creates his own worlds all the time. He's tapped into his childlike self constantly. And sure, I can put on a very formal business suit and go up on stage and talk in front of 5,000 people and seem very authoritarian, But I don't think people learn from that as much as they do from someone going on stage and sharing their excitement for knowledge and what they've learned alongside you. And I think that's the future of learning. And I think, you know, when you have teachers and parents who do that, I'm sure you find yourself going like, heck yeah, this is a really good teacher. Like I'm inspired uh, versus somebody telling you something. You should be discovering with people and that, that discovery is fun. Thank you to Amber Case, author of a kid's book about technology, for joining us today. You can learn more about this book and others like it by visiting akidsco.com. And thank you to Azalea for adding your voice to the show. My name is Azalea. I am 11 years old. I live in Ontario, Canada, and my favorite things are reading and skating. Want to be on a future episode of A Kid's Book About the Podcast? Write to us or record a message and email us at listen at a kid's podcast about dot com. A kid's book about the podcast is written, edited and produced by me, Matthew Winner, with help from Chad Michael Snavely and the team at Sound On Studios. Our executive producer is Jelani Memory. And this show was brought to you by a kid's podcast about follow the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found. And check out other podcasts made for kids just like you by visiting a kid's dot com. Join us next week for a conversation about death with a kid's book about author Taryn Shulk. A Kid's Book About is now a kid's company about empowering a generation of kids through diverse storytelling. Visit akidsco.com and explore a wealth of books, podcasts, and classes for kids of all ages. While you're there, check out A Kid's Class About, an all-new education streaming platform designed for tweens and teens, focused on careers, life skills, and big ideas. Visit akidsco.com for more information.